All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our event. Uh, it's entitled Supporting the Resilience of Young LGBTQA Plus Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. A Let's Talk About Resilience Conversation. My name is Lam. My pronouns are he, him, and I am a community organizer who creates events for queer people of color in the Boston area through a company called Men of Melanin Magic. And so now that I've introduced myself, uh, please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat box. Uh, we're gonna use the chat box a whole lot uh, for this conversation. And so uh, let us know a couple of things about you. Let us know your name and where you're from, but also let us know if you're experiencing some technical difficulties or some audio issues. Uh, and we'll try to get those fixed for you uh, quickly so that you can remain a part of the conversation. Um, and also we're encouraging you to type in questions as we go. Um, so I'm going to highlight a couple of terms just so that we can stay on the same page as we go throughout the conversation. Uh, the first one is BIPOC. Um, it's an acronym that stands for Black and Indigenous People of Color. So BIPOC. Um, and then we move into gender identity. Um, and that is a, an individual person's uh, sense of their gender expression. Um, and so that takes us back into uh, pronouns, um, which is how we can refer to people without using their names. And so, like I said, my name is Lam. I also use the pronouns he and him. And so please be mindful of other people's pronouns so that you do not misgender them. Um, and so if you want for, uh, fuller definitions of these terms, we do have links to them, uh, to resources, glossaries, and uh, a lot of different information that will really give you all that you need uh, to feel supported in this ever expanding world of language. Um, another piece of housekeeping is that we're going to be a very large group of folks. And so we are muting the microphones of our attendees. And just so that we can limit background noise and uh, keep our full attention to the conversation. Again, we encourage you to use the chat box to its fullest capacity, um, typing in your questions, but also your thoughts. I want you to think of the chat box as like a live Twitter feed. So just as pop things pop into your mind, throw them in, because who knows, we might just be able to use them in the conversation. And if we have time, uh, we'll uh, use some of those four question and answers near the end of the conversation. So as you all are getting more comfortable with the, the chat, I see we have Jordan from Providence, Rhode Island. Welcome, keep on chatting in the box. Um, so as we are getting comfortable with the chat box, I wanna give you a little bit more information about the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center Network, otherwise known as MHTTCN. Uh, its core mission is to use evidence-based means to disseminate evidence-based mental health practices across the region of New England. Um, and it helps to support on regional and even national levels, recovery-oriented practices, including recovery supports within the context of recovery-oriented systems of care, um, whether that includes peer support, uh, employment, education, parenting, spirituality, it runs the gamut of it all. And so we're really appreciative to the New England MHTTC uh, for uh, allowing us to have this conversation. And I think it's going to be a dynamic one. We have a whole lot of great and fantastic and fascinating people on our panel. And I can't wait for us to jump in. And so I won't wait for us to jump in and we will have them introduce themselves. They'll tell you their names, their pronouns, and, and then we'll get started with some great questions. How about that? And so I think we can start with you, Lindsay, and then uh, you can pass it al along to our other panelists. All right, hi everyone. 
My name is Lindsay Harrington and I use she and they pronouns. Uh, and then I'll pass it over to Steph and Sam. Nice. Hi. You want to go first? Go ahead. All right. My name is Stephanie Maryshow. I use she, her pronouns. I identify as a queer woman um, or lesbian, if you will. Um, I'm a local community organizer in Western Massachusetts and a business owner in Springfield, Mass. Hi. I was going to say good morning. Time is a social construct. Um, <laughs> Uh, but hi, happy to be here. My name is Simbrit Paskins. Most people just call me Sim, like Sim card. Um, I'm co-owner, one of two co-owners of the Ethnic Study Core Cafe and Bookstore in downtown Springfield with Steph here um, from Springfield, Massachusetts. My pronouns are she and her, and I identify as queer. Awesome. So now that we're all familiar with each other, um, I think we can jump in with our very first question. As you all know, uh, the, the root of this whole conversation, uh, the foundation of it all is about resilience. And so uh, to our panelists, I'm wondering, let us know what the term or what this word resilience means to you. I can start. Um, I think resilience is a really loaded word. Um, I think for, I feel like the last like 10, 20 years is pretty trendy and, and pretty ascribed to communities of color um, as kind of like a badge of honor for having to deal with adversity. Um, and I think a lot of times for people of color, there isn't a choice around being resilient. I think living every day in a system and society that isn't made for you, that makes your life harder. Um, yeah, living is, is being resilient. So I do think there, there are two sides of it too, because I do think those skills and strengths that people of color then learn from that are really special and beautiful. And it does um, you know, cultivate this unique set of skills. Um, but I do struggle around the choice point around having to be resilient. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I'll say resilience is exhausting. <laughs> um, like I, like Lindsay said, like we have no choice as people of color, as queer women, as queer, you know, just all these different identities. We struggle with so many different like forms of oppression on a regular basis. And it's exhausting and it's something that we kind of have no choice but to do. Um, I feel like resilience is like being able to find joy in like all of this. I feel like resilience is like choosing to be on panels and choosing to still be like proud and like, mm -hmm. and, and out um, in whatever form it is that we're in. And I think we were talking and we were saying like resilience is rest. Yeah. Like, you know, it's okay like to be strong and everything all the time. No, not all the time. Like sometimes you gotta just get rest <laughs> and like, let yourself feel vulnerable and like all these things. But I feel like that's like the hardest part of it. But yeah, for me, resilience is definitely exhausting, but it's something that we have no choice but to do. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I also work with young people um, and I was teaching a class once on resilience. So when this question came up, I was like, oh, like I should have all the right answers. Um, but I, to me, resilience is like not having all the right answers and being able to lean on your community to pull information and to like do like you and those sort of things. Um, and I remember showing this video to the students because they were younger and I was trying to give them like a visual and the video showed the little, oh, what do you call them? The little dolls that you, there. the bottom is like, you know, rounded. So you tip it over oh, and it just kind of oh, lays down. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's like, oh my God, it's like these little kindergartners and they're at the table and the teacher's like, what is resilience? And so they're like all playing with the toys. <laughs> and it was probably the most simple like imagery to describe to my students to help them understand at like a base level what um, resilience or this idea of like bouncing back is. But I think something I didn't think about until now is like, it's, it's about like being flexible too so not just like every time you fall get get back up get back up but also like um being flexible 
enough to understand that like plans change and this person to my left is going to really feed my soul in this way and this person to my right is going to really like feed my soul in this way and I can sort of ebb and flow between those two things so that's um that's how the definition has like morphed over time and more presently for me yeah so I'm picking up on some of the terms that were used just now like um, it is a loaded word because it means a whole lot for uh, a lot of different people um, and it encompasses a whole lot of different feelings and emotions. Um, and out of that could be a feeling of exhaustion and, and frustration. Um, but then, uh, Sim, you, you brought up the, the whole point about going with the flow, like the ebb and the, the flow of things. Um, and so it, it is important to understand that this is a very complex and, and layered kind of a phenomenon um, that we experience, um, especially in uh, communities that uh, identify as BIPOC. Um, and so thanks for speaking to the complexity of those things. Um, and so I kind of want you to finish a sentence for me. Um, we're going to try try to do this like in a, a rapid kind of thing. So just like the very first thing that comes to mind, um, I want you to say it. Um, and we can start with you, Sim, and then pass it around. Um, but finish the sentence for me. When you're faced with a difficult situation, what's the, fir the first thing you do is blank. Breathe. What was that? Breathe. Breathe, okay, all right. Uh, tell me a little bit more about uh, why you chose that. Sure. <laughs> you said rapid fire, so I was like, one word. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would say breathe. Um, and it's easier said than done. And it's actually not something I'm good at, but it's something I'm learning how to do. Like mm. my, I think to this concept of like resilience and also this conversation that comes up all the time around being like, you know, fitting into or fitting out of the strong Black woman stereotype. Mm -hmm. um, I find myself going full days where I'm just like taking shallow breaths and I'm just like, all right, that was really, excuse my language negative, but like, I'm just going to keep going. Okay. My feelings were hurt, but I'm going to keep going. Okay. Like I'm feeling this really intense emotion and it's negative and I can't talk about it, but I'm going to keep going. And so I've been learning to just like breathe, like stop wherever I am yeah. because that's self-care and I need to like take a deep breath and then yeah. I can decide like what the next step is um so when I'm faced with a difficult situation which is I mean all the time I could end this zoom and something could pop up um it's important to me to just like calmate and like slow down a little bit yeah and you know what I think that touches on something uh you know of course that you you said earlier about the ebb and flow but yeah. also like giving yourself the permission mm -hmm. to pause like I've, I've seen a video on TikTok where it says, nobody's coming. No one's coming <laughs> to tell you to do this and to do that. Okay. And so you have, to, you have to give yourself the permission to say, okay, all right, I'm breathing real shallow right now because there's a yeah. lot of things going on right now. And I yeah. could choose to be flustered mm -hmm. and get carried away with that. Or I can give my, myself the permission to press pause right. and breathe. Right. So thank okay. you for that. Absolutely. All right, let's, <laughs> Lindsay. Rapid fire. What's the first thing you do when you're faced with a difficult situation? Think. Think. Okay. All right. All right. Now tell me a little bit more why you, cho you chose the word think. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in astrology and I have a lot of earth placements. I'm very drawn to action. Um, so I think similar to the, the concept of breathing, I think giving myself permission to look at all of the solutions um, and pick the one that makes the most sense for me in the moment, rather than like my gut reaction to like take immediate action and to solve all the problems right away, um, which I'm usually drawn to do. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So we first breathe and then we think, you know, <laughs> get put our, wrap our minds around it. Now, Steph, what, what, what do you do? What's the first thing you do when you're faced with a difficult situation? So um, I was going to say the first thing I do is like stop, but I mean, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think I stop, I think, and then I breathe. Mm. So I hope my breath works. Stop, drop, and roll. <laughs> I hope my breath, <laughs> I hope my breath stop, drop, and roll. <laughs> I don't do that. But 
I, I hold my breath for a very long time while I'm trying to figure things out. Like the first thing that came to mind when you asked that is like something small, but you know, like how small things, yeah. like the smallest thing is like that last, what is it called? The, the, the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah. Um, so yesterday I was at, we were at our co-working space and, you know, we're there mm -hmm. and I'm running the cafe and I had like, I had been going and I mean, it's, then it's like 11, 1130 AM. I hadn't had my coffee mm -hmm. yet. I hadn't eaten anything. I was already tired. We don't close till five. And I grabbed my salad and I grabbed my oat and honey ice latte that I just made myself. Yes. And I know, right. And it was a large one too. And I was excited and I sat down and I put it on, we have these little like college kind of chairs that like the, the desk swings in and out. I sit everything down, I sit in the chair, I swing the desktop into myself and my latte flies and falls and splatters all across the floor. <laughs> and <laughs> like, there was just that one thing that like, I, I promise you, I pictured myself losing it. <laughs> like just getting up and leaving. But like, I literally just sat there and it's blessed on Sam and she kind of like screamed, but I just sat there and, and she was like, ah, and I was like, it's okay. <laughs> like, I just literally like, I, I said, it's okay. And I sat there and stared at it for honestly like a minute. <laughs> I probably looked nuts, Yeah. but it was, it, but in order for me to say, look, Steph, this happened, you have to clean it up anyway. Like there's no use in freaking out, even if it may be inwardly, like just get up and clean it up. You can make yourself another one. But that was really hard for me. And that's something I'm training myself because I wanted to like run out of the, the, the co-working space. But yeah, so what I did was I just stopped and I stared at it. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> um, but then, yeah, I, then I took my deep breath. Yes. And then I went and, and, and cleaned it up. So I think I noticed that with things other than like coffee spilling, but like I literally just stopped and I just have to stop for a moment before like, because when you react out of like emotion, mm -hmm. you know, you can, you can really do the wrong thing sometimes or, or say the wrong thing. So I've been trying to teach myself that. Um, but that's, that's my example. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I think that's, that's wonderful because it, it helped to uh, really uh, encompass a lot of what we, we said already, where there's that moment when we give ourselves the permission to pause and breathe and then think, wrap this situation around in my mind, um, and then uh, spring into action. Um, and so, yeah, stop, drop, and roll <laughs> when it comes to um, being faced with a, a difficult decision. Because sometimes things can come up and make it and and seem like a fire, um, and everything's burning down. And but in those kinds of moments, um, there there's that moment when you have to just like. Um, pause and okay here's something going on I need to do something about it and and it gets done um so I think that's that's a great thing um other folks are saying that um they they too they also get anxious and have to remind themselves to take deep breaths so I think we're on a a, a good track here um let's see uh somebody else said oh that you can phone a friend too um and yeah, after we collect our minds, phone a friend. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that kind of, that can help to segue into a little, an, another part of the, the conversation um, that I want to bring up. And it's kind of, it, it hits on the topic of communal resiliency. So we talked about how uh, resiliency uh, can manifest in a personal or individual kind of way. Um, but I'm, I'm curious to know how it can also happen within more of a communal sense, more like uh, publicly or in a, a community, especially now that we're talking about uh, Black and Indigenous people of color. Um, how do we as a people uh, do resiliency together? Um, and so a specific question that I had is, uh, when and where do you find, uh, where, where do you most find yourself encouraging people or um, particularly queer people of color, how, where do you find yourself most encouraging them to be resilient? And when you do find those moments, 
What are you telling them? What do you say to them? What comes to mind for me um, is I encounter a lot of like youth um, or even like, I mean, I guess I would say youth, but um, people even my age, I'm 30 and dealing with like that whole hurt of like family not accepting them, right? Um, or saying they accept them, but then having like little like uh, remarks and things like that that are hurtful. Um, I feel like for a while, it took me a long time to like have to learn how to have a tough skin and like kind of let certain remarks and stuff, um, you know, roll off. But I think most of my advice that I give to people who are dealing with families that won't accept them is like teaching them about like community care and like community resilience, right? Like there's a whole group of people that have experienced what you're experiencing. And it doesn't invalidate your experience because, you know, so, you know, everyone's uh, experience is individual, but like, look to those people. Like, you know, what is that, um, what is that term about the family? Like your found family? Chosen or family? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, I think that's my advice is like, if you can't find the resilience on your own, right? Because like the stuff hurts, like hate your family, like hating you or, or not accepting you because of who you are that you can't change. Yeah. It's hurtful and it's discouraging, but the resilience comes when you find people who have made it through and people who can encourage you through that. So literally my first advice is always like, you got me, you got Sam, and like, let's find some more people that can hold you up until you, you know, learn how to get through this. Mm -hmm. So people with shared experiences are really a huge part of that. Mm -hmm. I like that, people with shared experiences. Anyone else want to jump in on this? <laughs> yeah, I was thinking, um, it's like hard for me to think of a place because I, I think where it's happening for me is like in group texts with my friends and my peers. Um, you know, I think I, I feel really lucky going through school, getting to find people who are similar to me and, and who are, you know, BIPOC and queer. Um, and so thinking of the moments when we're encouraging each other to be resilient. It's like those everyday moments when someone says something off color to you or like someone just irritates you uh, and just kind of getting through the day and, and, and living in that community, you know? Um, yeah, I don't have any, I was like, I lost my thought, that was it. <laughs> oh, I think, that, I think that's beautiful because uh, we do live in a, 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 a very technological world. And especially now, the, you know, living through a, a pandemic, a lot of the times then that we were communicating with people was over these kinds of means, Zoom or, or a group chat. And uh, using those formats as a way to uh, encourage people and to say, you know, we, we can make it through this, we can, uh, we can persevere. Um, and uh, whether it's on a larger scale of a pandemic to even like uh, uh, other more day-to-day -day things, um, I think group chats are a stellar uh, addition to this conversation because we're not in the same space with people all the time. Um, and uh, it's, it's the little things, Steph was talking earlier about like, it's the little things that can really help people to, to push and, and keep moving forward. Uh, so that, yeah chat boxes, this virtual life that we're living, uh, it's real. So uh, I think that's a great addition. Uh, Sam, you still thinking? Cause uh, no. we, we can, you know, no, I well, I don't, want, I don't want you all to feel pressure that you have to answer like every question. Right. Uh, if, if we've exhausted that part, <laughs> that's no problem at all. Right. Uh, um, no, I was thinking of, because you know what it is, is like, I think, both of you kind of mentioned like having shared experiences and that is true that this is zoom right now so a lot of i think what we're saying is like i second that and i agree with that and that's that's real too i was thinking about um so before i think like i was fully out mm -hmm. and before like to the community it was like it was like my close friends and mentors first who knew about my sexuality and then it was my family um, so it wasn't, it wasn't the other way. It wasn't the way you would expect. Like, it wasn't like I sat in the living room with my parents and my siblings and then 
pulled everyone like it wasn't you know it was kind of backwards because of, of, of my chosen family and the people that I felt like would accept me 100 percent but like before that um I wasn't really seeing a lot of like queer black women anywhere mm -hmm. really um like not really in the media not really definitely not in school like <laughs> From K through 12, uh, I definitely wasn't seeing anything. And then when I got to college and I uh, switched my major to ethnic and gender studies, I was introduced to Audre Lorde. And I was 17 in my freshman year of college. So I was like the person that's always the youngest <laughs> in the group of friends. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, oh my God, there are black, like female queer authors and poets at that, because I love poetry. So I found that like I could find I could find like my chosen family in like books too and like poetry and I think it's just because I, I like reading and writing and that sort of thing so that was a medium for me but it exists for people who love music it exists for people who love art it exists for people who are into sports or politics and so like I found even when I'm physically alone or mm. feeling like I can't find the right person to text or to call which can happen sometimes like I really get in my head sometimes that I have like Sonia Sanchez right next to me, you know, or I have like Bettina Love to my right. Like these are really tools. Um, and that's part of the reason why, like with our business, why we have the bookstore, you know, attached to it so that people can find themselves in those spaces as well. One thing to add, if that's okay. Yeah. I dropped something. Um, yeah, so like she, like everything everyone said, and then like leading into like the bookstore, like I realized. I think subconsciously, or maybe consciously, the ethnic study, the space that we've created, mm. literally, I feel like that's what its purpose is. Like mm. the mission of that, like no matter what else, we can have a cafe, we can have a bookstore, we can have co-working. Right. But ultimately, right. like when you walk into our space, you're seeing art all around the room that is made by BIPOC people that are local to Springfield, mm. Holyoke area. Um, mm. You're hearing music. Um, from, you know, me and Sam are Trinidadians, where, you know, <laughs> yeah. 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 so like when you come in, you're hearing soca music, when you come in, you're seeing like, you know, this is a safe space and you're seeing like, you know, all are welcome here and you're like, you come into a space where even if you know no one that you can like resonate with or anyone that you can like connect with, mm -hmm. when you walk into that space, you see a, a queer black woman standing behind the cafe making your latte, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. You see a selection of books that are curated for marginalized communities. So I, I feel like my advice is always to find that community and find these spaces where you're safe. And mm -hmm. I always forget, I'm like not, the, I'm really good at what I do, but like I'm not a good business person because I never <laughs> talk about my business. But I'm like realizing like the ethnic study and other spaces like that are places where I would send people to. Yeah. Because even if you're sitting there to go read a book by yourself, you're surrounded by people who are not going to question who you are. Yeah, um, yeah no. So I, because that that touches on like a whole different level of what the question was asking. Because at first it was like, what are you verbally saying to people? And what you're saying is that sometimes it's not so much in the words that you're using, but the atmosphere that you're setting. Um, uh, you are intentionally creating a space where people can instantly feel as though they belong. Um, and sometimes it's it's better to, uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember the quote, but it's, uh, it's something along the lines of um, preach the gospel, but um, only when necessary use words. So basically it's saying like, you be, um, the love that you want to show into the world. Um, and at, sometimes that's, that's, that's enough. You don't have to use your words, use your actions. Um, and so it helps me to get into, y'all Y'all are really flowing this conversation. I would just like to say that because what I want to ask is, um, especially using the term of chosen family and then also people uh, with shared experiences, um, gathering together or finding each other. Um, I'm wondering when it comes to creating a support system or a network of support for yourself, what are some qualities that you look in for people, that you look in for people um, so that you know for yourself with certainty that 
you are supported. Can I be that person to say that I have ADHD? And I started reading the chat. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, because I'm that person too. Okay. <laughs> and so basically I'm asking like, what are some qualities that you look for in people? Um, and I, I could use the, the term friend, but I think that that term kind of gets um, watered down a little bit, especially when you think about Facebook and like everybody is your friend on Facebook. Uh, like they ascribe that title to people, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are your friend. Um, and so like when you're looking for a, a support system or you're building your network of support, what are some qualities that you look for in people? I have one that I recently identified because um, usually I'm like, I'm an Aquarius and I <laughs> am a very like easygoing, laid back person. And I'm just like, oh, everyone just come be my friend. But that's not always the best thing to do. Um, mm -hmm. So recently I realized how much energy it takes. Like, like this is my first time being in my customer service and meeting 25, 30 new people every day and having these conversations that can become really exhausting. Um, and but the people kind of who stick around and like become kind of like a part of the ethnic study um, and people that we like we get, get excited to see for me are people who like our conversation just flows mm -hmm. like where I I look for like people that I can like even consider being like a safe person or a person that can support me is like when I don't have to like I don't have to think about how to say this mm -hmm. or like if it's okay for me to you know be like oh sorry I didn't hear that or like you know I have ADHD whatever just be myself and if that conversation can just go and if it can flow if it's somebody who I feel like I have to use way too much energy to try to communicate with or, or connect with I feel like you no know, maybe this just isn't the person doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with them or me but I feel like the people who are meant to be that support for you like are they they gravitate towards you like it's it's easy um so yeah, that's what comes to mind for me. Okay, yeah, like an like an ease. Like there's this chemistry that you can have a shorthand communication with them. It doesn't have it doesn't take a lot of energy. I like that. And mm -hmm. uh, you can just be yourself. Uh, anyone else want to jump in? What are some qualities you look for in people who support you? I I would just say that like uh people who can completely take me as I am, you know what I mean? So like I, the joke around, I think like our crew of people is that like, I'm not like a hugger, right? Like hugs feel so great. And that whole like science experiment about hanging on for, uh, there's a certain amount of seconds that like, what is this? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that energy transfer like that, that's, that's real and that's amazing but I'm not always in the place for that. And the people who I found like strongest connections with understand that like I show love and receive love in different ways and they're okay with that. So I don't have to like shape shift. I find in the world, I, I feel like I have to, you know, be all these different things depending on where I'm at and who I'm, or yeah, where I'm at and who I'm with. But like the people who I click with the most, um, I don't have to, I don't have to be like that with I can I have like a little toy poodle I could like talk up you know with all my like you're so cute the little like you know my little dog puppy talk or whatever in front of them they don't care I can eat nachos for breakfast lunch and dinner it's my favorite food group <laughs> you know what I'm saying like those are those are my people and I find that they're um sometimes like the most unlikely someone if I ran into them and the grocery store and probably just like walk right by <laughs> um so yeah I think so when she says that it, it makes me think of like okay so we have a couple friends that come in I'm a hugger I hug everyone I don't care who you are right. as long as you want a hug I'm gonna give you a hug Simba is not like that I'll be like oh <laughs> she'll, <laughs> she'll, she'll block you real quick um but so you we have our friends who come into the ethnic study and I'm, I'll hug all of them and they'll come over and they'll say like Sim you want to hug today like it's like the cutest thing awesome. um but I think that boils down to like some actual like words because I feel like we're telling stories but like yeah. people who are um I guess in tune or like intuitive right like you you they are they care so much about others feelings that they are 
gonna sit and watch and observe and, and make sure you're in the space to receive whatever energy they have. Yeah. Um, so they'll ask, Sam, are you, you know, are you in the mood for a hug today? Or um, they'll let me know. My feelings used to get hurt, but I'm okay now. <laughs> like Steph, I'm not in the mood for a hug today. And I'm like, okay. Um, or, you know, they'll come and like, they'll walk in and I'll be like, oh, you look, you know, sad or down. And they'll just say like, I am, but like, let me know if you're in a place where you can handle this mm-hmm. if I talk to you about it. Like, there's people who are just really compassionate and like, like I said, like intuitive and just care enough about themselves to like set boundaries and then care enough about us to like respect ours. Um, yeah. No, I think that's real. Uh, especially uh, in light of like the pandemic, I think uh, folks who were open to learning lessons from um, this this chapter of the world, um, I think we're able to dig deeper into what it means to respect people's boundaries or to, um, especially when it comes to, to touch our culture, when you're meeting someone, you, you know, put your hand out, shake it. And uh, that might not be, that's not everything ain't for everybody. Um, and so I think we're learning the different ways of communicating uh, with people uh, and, and, uh, and accepting and loving people for the different ways in which they receive uh, that communication. Um, Lindsay, I wanna give you a chance to jump in if you if you feel necessary. Yeah, I feel like my thoughts really echo what Sim and Steph have shared. And I was having a hard time like thinking of like a tangible word that covers it. Cause I do think a lot of it is like a vibe, you know? Um, but I think when I'm trying to like narrow it down it's like that balance of a person who's like aware of themselves putting work into their journey and also make space for people who are doing the same kind of work. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that's important. Um, and and so I'm, I'm hoping folks are, what the folks in the audience are listening because these are really great ways of uh, spotting who, is for you and who uh, you can lean on for support because I think that's that's really important when it comes to resiliency, especially when we were talking about um, building that uh, communal resilience. Um, it's it's those people with whom you can be yourself. Uh, they take you as you are. It doesn't take much energy to to be with each other. There's a a, a vibe and it's it feels easy. Um, and I I also want to. Uh, for me, um, I'm I'm big on on loyalty when it comes to like uh, who I'm I'm relying on for for my uh, safety not safety um, but my support system um, and for me that is when people uh, will bring your name up in rooms full of opportunities um, they know who you are and what you're able to bring to the table. And especially when it comes to BIPOC folks and you know just queer people of color, sometimes opportunities don't come um, in, in a way that it does for other people. And so for those people to bring up your name um, when opportunity arises, um, I, it's, it, that's a beautiful thing to me. This is, and it's pretty much what happened for me to be moderating this conversation. So I want to shout out Amani. Thank you for plugging me in. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, though, I think that's a, a huge quality when it comes to building your, your support system. Um, so of course we have a couple more questions. Um, I want to keep the ball rolling and the momentum flowing um, and uh, get to a, a little bit more of a, a deeper level of things. Um, so, Continuing uh, the conversation on resilience um, and uh, you know pushing through to get to the other side, and I guess for a better, lack of a better, better term, uh, to win. Um, there's a, a Fantasia song that says that sometimes you have to lose to win, and so I'm curious, what is something that you had to lose or something that you had to let go that ended up helping you to succeed? Right? <laughs> it's getting hot in here. <laughs> Wait, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna say that I'm thinking about that. I need to think, but <laughs> that question is so, it's so deep. Uh, I'm gonna 
I'm going to mute real quick. Hold on. <laughs> okay, no problem. If anyone else wants to jump in, let me know. I, I don't mind jumping in myself too. Yeah, I, I can jump in. I think on the thread of what we're talking about, uh, relationships, I think for me is something that I've had to lose in order to win. I'm loving like the overlap of experiences because every time all of you are talking, I'm like, yes, yes, yes. And I think, you know, when I was younger, um, a lot of my friends, we used like this language around like blind loyalty. It's like you would meet people, they were your people, that was it. And you had to stick with them, you know, it was ride or die. And, and I was really riding with people who, you know, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't working for us. Mm. And I've, I've stayed in so many friendships because I'm like, that is my person. I have to stay with this person. But all along, you know, it's not feeling like a fit, like I'm having a feeling inside or I'm putting a lot of um, energy or, or I'm spending time with them and it's not feeling good or I'm not looking forward to it. And it took a long time for me to pay attention to those things in myself and to learn what does it look like to actually set boundaries with people? I think at first it was really daunting. It was this cut or dry, you have to be done with people. You know, if they don't get you, if they're not there for you, and I've had to learn small ways to to limit people's access to me and, and to really give my, myself permission to be choosy and that that doesn't make you like fake or, or flaky, you know, that that's what allows you to continue to be being resilient. You know, I think we have to be choosy about who we're giving to. Yes. Yeah. And just to uh, like a call back to what you said earlier, the vibes, uh, if the vibe's not vibing, then it's, it's okay to, again, give yourself permission to, uh, to do what, that, what serves you. And if this particular connection is not serving you, you, you have the autonomy uh, to, uh, for lack of a better term, but cut that off um, for, for the, be the betterment of your growth. So thank you for um, jumping in with that. Um, curious to hear from others. Do you have anything I know? Yeah, do you have anything I know? I do, you go first. <laughs> Thanks. Chivalry is not, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, what did I have to like go to win? Um, so I realized in the, the middle of COVID when I was like at home Zoom teaching on the screen, how much of a perfectionist I truly in like the core of my soul am. Um, and that comes from a lot of things. Um, I think a lot of it comes from the way that I was raised in a like super West Indian Christian household where there's just a certain way that you're supposed to do things, um, including being straight, right? Like <laughs> there's a certain way that you're supposed to, uh, you're supposed to procreate and you're supposed to, me as a female identifying person is supposed to like be in a relationship with a man and then I'm supposed to like all these expectations um and I didn't realize how much of that I had like ingested right or digested one of those words and so I realized when I was like stuck at home with myself and like the computer screen how much I was like relying on everything going according to some sort of plan and when I was able to let that go with the help of like all of these family and all the things that we've been talking about that's when um, I think like my vision for my life sort of changed and really like was able to take control of it in a way that allowed us to not only like create the ethnic study, but like really stand on my own two feet as um, someone who for in regards to like sexuality and stuff, like someone who came out like later in life, right? Like it really helped me to stop being apologetic about little things. Um, it helped us to sort of create the ethnic study, but to lead a lot of the Black Lives Matter actions that happened in our community last summer, um, where you know we were in positions to be leaders of these actions, but we didn't really anticipate being the ones like always holding the megaphone. You know, we're always being at the front of the line. We just sort of got pushed to the front and, and decided like, okay, we could we could do this. But like that's where letting go of sort of the the need to be like perfect and have everything together and have the answers for everybody and for everything helped me personally be able to like step into that space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, yeah. So letting go, I feel like there's like it's full. Oh, I have many thoughts, 
Lindsay was talking about this like ride or die, like loyalty, like to friends that you're supposed to have, even if they're wrong and even if they're hurting you, like you, we were just taught like, that's your friend, you gotta have their back, right? Like, so with that, I feel like that was very toxic, <laughs> a toxic like way of thinking, like growing up for me. And I went through a lot, like of really bad friends that I just let um, treat me however, right? But I, I realized what that comes from is like this toxic relationship, like I have with certain family members. Mm -hmm um and you know you're taught like oh that's your that's your elder that's your mom that's your dad whatever you have to respect them you have to have you know you have to have this connection with them um but again as a queer woman who is like masculine of center and doesn't wear dresses doesn't look the part for like what a, a woman is supposed to look like you know to this to society or whatever um I feel like there was a lot of people I had on to that were just constantly hurting me and making little remarks. Growing up in church, again, West Indian, like very similar uh, experiences. And um, so I had to let go of, and this is like recently, y'all, I'm going through like, I don't know if it's like the age of 30, like I don't know what's <laughs> going on, but recently I'm learning all these things of like, I, I had to let go of certain family members my Facebook is so clear right now because I have blocked <laughs> all the people I needed to block. It hurts, you know what I mean? But like family members, friends, um, I had to like, I love going to church and like love God, but I had to let go of like that kind of fellowship or like, you know, going to church and things like that because um, I didn't feel comfortable being in there. You know what I mean? I'm in there with my high top fade and like yeah. <laughs> my blazer on and it just wasn't feeling right. So I just feel like with me being, you know, a queer woman, I had to let go of like a lot of my like spiritual like connections, my, you know, church family, my my family. Mm -hmm. And then with moving forward as a woman of color owning a business with their partner, um, you know, there's a lot of community connections that we had to let go of. There's a lot of people who even just owning a business and people just like are not happy for you because they don't have it. There are lots of people who I thought were like loyal friends who that talk about they, it. Talk, but, talk about yeah. it. <laughs> the people like I promise you, people just who I thought were like best friends just cannot be happy sometimes for you. Um, yeah. And it's like I wouldn't wish half of what we deal with as business owners who at the time were like renovating the space, starting writing a business plan, and protesting like twelve hours a day every day of the week. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't even put that on anybody, but like they wanted it and they couldn't be around us because we had it. And so like, you have to actually give up a lot in order to like live your truth and be who you are. Um, but then you have to like surround yourself with people that can teach you how to fill that those spaces yeah. back up. You know what I mean? No, no. It's cause you lose I mean it's gone, you know? Well, one um, thing I like to uh, say to folks is, I'd rather four quarters than a hundred pennies. I say that all the time. And oh, for real? Ah! <laughs> yes. <laughs> but this is so real. It still adds up to a dollar, but listen, the quality of that dollar. Listen. But um, okay, so I want to ask a, a final question that I had. And I do know we have one question uh, from the audience. Um, from Valerie Gold. Um, and uh, so I'll ask my question and, and then we can get to Valerie's question. Um, so the question is, of course, I don't, I can't find it now. Um, but it's basically when you have been resilient and you did what you were supposed to do, um, how do you celebrate? Let us in on the special ways in which you tell yourself, well done. And it doesn't have to be some like huge grand parade, um, but what for you, what are some special ways that you let yourself, you know, pat yourself on the back and be like, you know what, I did that and I can celebrate it. I want to go. Oh. Uh, oh, no, 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 go ahead. No, you, I went first last time. Okay. <laughs> um, I feel like, again, just because we're still in the middle of this, like we've only been open in our business for a year. Actually, the protesting and everything so all has happened with, like since June 2nd, 2nd 20, uh, 2020. And so all of this is just really fresh. Um, we have been working on this nonstop since June. Um, 
we, uh, you know, we're, we're volunteering our time, you know, the businesses don't make enough money to like pay, you know, their owners and stuff like that until like the first two years and like all these things like, and I feel like, you know, we're doing it because we know it's worth and we know what it does for the community and for us. Um, but like, you know, thinking about there's these moments where like, oh, it's been five months and I haven't even like thought of myself for two seconds. Like that was resilient. And like, you know, we made sure like we did what we had to do. Um, but like, I will like, honestly give myself like two, three days of just like no responsibility, phones off, yeah. emails off, um, yeah. not feeling guilty about it either. Um, not feeling obligation to like go see family and stuff like that. Like whatever I want to do is what I want to do. So kind of just, even if it's only three days out of however long, like giving yourself that space to just do whatever it is that you have been neglecting or putting to the side. Um, I, I'm just realizing how much rest is like so important. Um, so yeah, it's like rest and like zero obligations for a little while. Mm. And um, yeah, I think, and surrounding myself with people who are, don't take energy from me. Um, even if I'm yeah. just sitting there, you know, watching a movie, or unless we want to go out, whatever it is, finding people that aren't expecting much from me. Uh, that's how I celebrate. Yeah. I thought we were going to say the same thing. So that just shows you that, like, we're in the same place. <laughs> it tells you what we need most right now. Um, I was totally going to say rest. And I was going to say that it, it's, like, easier said than done. Um, that my MO is very much like, go, go, go on to the next. Um, people who know me well know that like, like I'm the person where they're like, oh, Sim always has like 15 projects going on at one time. You got this. Um, so a pat on the back for me is it, like being able to be like, I don't got this actually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't got it at all. <laughs> and um, rest lately has been, so I used to think it was either like spa day kind of stuff mm. or or like sleep um but now I'm finding like it's it's like doing what I feel most like filled up or fueled to do gotcha. so gotcha. like this morning I put on Facebook like did anyone want to go for a walk with me because I was just I wake up really early for no reason none <laughs> no reason uh <laughs> And I was just like, I'm gonna go by myself. So I got all bundled up and I put the little coat on the little, you know, dog. Yeah, and yeah. we like went <laughs> for a really long walk and it was so great. Um, <laughs> but it was just the thing that like, I wanted to do in that moment that felt good for me. And it, that seems like a really simple thing for a lot of people maybe. But for me, it's a big deal because one, I, I might've like typically in the past, I might've waited for someone to be like, yeah, I'll go with you right? Which can be hard if you're always relying on other people to like refuel you in that way. Mm -hmm. um, or I would have made myself busy with work. Like I literally had my computer right here and I would have been like, okay, I'm up early. Like I have all this free time, free time. Like I'll just start responding to emails and I just to make the decision for me to be like, yeah, I'm going to go get some fresh air for a really long time is how I've been celebrating. And it has nothing to do with other people. It's, it's about like myself and how I'm learning to take care of myself. So yeah yeah beautiful Lindsay jump on in round us out I think I really appreciate your question because it's a good reminder for me that I don't celebrate enough and I am I'm really working on that and trying to diversify the ways that I celebrate right I think what Sim and Steph are sharing around um celebration yeah not always looking like the rah-rah going out, but like, how do we celebrate in the small moments? Um, but I will say, I do love to treat myself. So that is how I like to celebrate. I'd be out, I'd be out going out to eat, buying ridiculous right. things. Um, <laughs> but I'm trying to bring celebration more into um, just like daily routine and habits. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. Um, okay, so we're going to get to Valerie's question, and we're going to do it in a lightning kind of way. Um, and so this conversation is targeted towards youth. And so Valerie's asking, how do we as adults 
make sure that we are doing all we can to connect BIPOC, LGBTQ plus folks or LGBTQ plus young people in our lives with opportunities. Rapid fire. Ooh, we did that at the same time. I bet you about the same thing. <laughs> um, we have this young person, um, his name is Richard and he, so Simbert knew Richard, he identifies as gay and Simbert knew Richard and taught him in like a program back when he was like probably 16 or 17, yeah. maybe. And we needed a website. She loved his like Instagram is beautiful. Um, great pictures, all this stuff. We didn't know if he could do a website, but Sam's like, hey, let's reach out to him and give him some opportunity. It's tough. He comes from a Jamaican, really like traditional household, and he lives his best life. I mean, walking out of the house with yeah. 12 eight inch heels and his eyeshadow and everything looking like a star. Yeah. Um, so we wanted him to be around us. He hooked our website up. You can check it out, theethnicstudy.org. Um, <laughs> he hooked our website up, helped us with social media, did all these things. Now, I mean, he he's like, without us even asking, he comes into the ethnic study every day at 8.30 in the morning, because I'm always late. He <laughs> sets up, when I get there, the coffee's made, the hot water is heated up, like things are organized. And now he runs the cafe just as, as I do. Okay. And then my yeah. brother owns Dewey's Jazz Lounge right next door to us. He started out as a busser. My brother hired him, started out as a busser over there. And now he is becoming a bartender mm -hmm. um, and he is like so happy right now. And within a year, I've seen this really shy person who could barely look us in our eyes yep. blossom. And like, I have a video of him at Dewey's behind the bar dancing <laughs> and like just being so ama like amazing. He's just so amazing. And I feel like without that opportunity, he wouldn't have gotten to flourish the way he has. And he's grown so much. Um, so I feel like seeking out youth who identify as LGBTQ plus and giving them opportunities that they don't even know that they wanted or didn't even know that they needed and just being like look I see something great in you let's see what it is um let's see what it is uh that we can give you to help pull that out and um he he, he said like he's like I never felt so safe before and he you know what I mean so and that's just one um that's just one of, of many that we've encountered so I think you being safe and then showing, telling them that you see something special in them, even if the world doesn't, is really important. Yeah, I, I think that's a perfect answer to Valerie's question. Um, and so, uh, and Valerie agrees uh, <laughs> in the chat, says that's a beautiful example. Thank you. Um, so with that, I want to say thank you again uh, to be, for, for being wonderful panelists. Uh, the conversation went exactly as I thought it was going to be fascinating <laughs> and just full of rich content, rich uh, ideas and information. Um, and so folks, please take a look at this slide that's on your screen right now. Um, and be sure to visit the websites that you see here. Um, we want to acknowledge uh, all the folks who helped to put this together. Uh, I think this was a wonderful event. It's being recorded. And so you'll have a chance to watch it all over again and uh, really get uh, this information whenever you need it and use it as a, a source for your own personal resilience. Um, and so please follow the Ethnic Study on Instagram and the, their website is in the chat box as well. Lindsay, you wanna plug anything? Lindsay no. does not want to plug anything. <laughs> <laughs> I want to plug something. Um, follow Men of Melanin Magic on Instagram as well. I'm putting it down in the chat. Um, and future events, take a look at this slide. Um, November is chock full of things uh, and also uh, the beginning of December. Uh, if you're on your phone, screenshot it. If you're on your computer, do the same thing. Um, and uh, let's stay plugged in and uh, and be resilient. Be your, your best self with the best people uh, that you can find and, and life is for living, so do that. <laughs>